Dave Chappelle is the baddest person to touch a microphone uh, that's alive right now. Dave's a beast. Dave's a beast, man. That's the only man, only man that puts a little fear in my heart. I'm like, okay, it's real. What's he doing? What made you get on stage at the age of 14? The fear of death. He's our biggest genius. He's our biggest comedy genius. And he might he might be one of the biggest comedy geniuses ever, oh, yeah. but he's certainly our biggest comedy genius of today. He understands comedy like nobody else. If you ever want to do something great in your life, you're going to have to realize your failures. You're going to have to embrace them and figure out how to overcome them. Dave, in my opinion, you're the GOAT. In my opinion, your last special has allowed you to surpass the Richard Pryor. My mother used to tell me this thing. I don't even know if you remember, but you said this to me more than once. You said, son, sometimes you have to be a lion so you can be the lamb you really are. Well, yeah, I started when I was 14. That's when I, I figured it all out. Originally, my plan was I'll go to school, and then after I graduate, I'll start stand-up. But then I was like, I'm going to the club after school. It's Tuesday. So I'm going to go to that open mic night. I had been practicing with the candlestick in the mirror. I felt like I was ready. And I told my family I was going. I told my mom, you know, I'm going. I don't want you to come. I'm going to go by myself. It's something I got to do and whatever, whatever. So, of course, she shows up <laughs> with my grandmother <laughs> and, and my brother. And I told my grandmother, like, you might hear me say some things that you might not want to hear your grandson say. And she said, just relax and do that shit. I said, whoa. I never heard of JT introduced me. He said, folks, everybody's got to start somewhere. And tonight, this young man is starting here. I remember it like it was yesterday. He said, you might be witnessing the birth of a star. Please welcome Dave Chapel." <laughs> And I went up there, man, and I was scared. And I used to look at my feet when I started. And I said the first joke, looking down at my feet, and they laughed. And then I looked up, like, holy. And then I looked back down at my feet and said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and after the set, you know, the crowd was going crazy. I think I did two and a half minutes, but they were going crazy. I was 14, probably looked like I was 11. Jesus. I was telling jokes about Jesse Jackson running for president and Alf Spaceship landing in a black neighborhood. <laughs> I said, I'm going to go to that Apollo and rip that mug. I went for the regular Wednesday amateur night. When I say I got booed off stage, God. I asked. I still remember that boo. I'd never been booed off stage before, but I just remember looking out and seeing like everybody booing, everybody. <laughs> Even old people, I was like, who, who boos a child pursuing his dreams? <laughs> this is the, the meanest crowd in the world. And that sign went off. And a dude comes out tap dancing. Dun, 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 dun. Sand, Sandman. Sandman. I wanted to choke this shit out. I hate you. <laughs> and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Wow. Best thing because before that time, I had never bombed, let alone got booed off stage. And bombing was horrifying. Nobody wants to bomb. Nobody, this, you know, when you, people say you do comedy, what happens if nobody laughs? I don't know. <laughs> so that night was liberating because I failed so far beyond my wildest nightmares of failing that it was like, hey, they're all booing. My friends are here watching, my mom. This is not that bad. <laughs> and after that, I was fearless. Now the challenger. At 19, he's the youngest comedian in Star Search history. From Washington, D.C., here is Dave Chappelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. You guys notice Batman never fights crime in neighborhoods that need it. <laughs> I mean, really, I would love to see Batman fight crime in my neighborhood. I can see now, he just 
Robin. Yes, Batman. <laughs> Didn't we park the car right here, man? <laughs> uh. I mean, I'm not trying to say that being black is all bad. We got our perks. Like, you guys, uh, take terrorism, for example. That's pretty good. A terrorist has never taken a black hostage in the history of the world. <laughs> you will never see a black guy on the news reading one of those letters. <laughs> they is treating us good. <laughs> never. It's true. You know why they don't take black hostages? Because we're bad bargaining chips. <laughs> they would call up the White House, hello, we have got five black people. And we will, hello. <laughs> they gave me a career. We met in 1992 at a comedy club in New York City. We wrote a few jokes together over the years, but I'd always hoped we could do something bigger. Then in 1997, Dave calls me and goes, hey, if Universal reaches out to you, tell them we're writing a weed movie together. <laughs> and I was like, what weed movie? And Dave said, don't worry about it. <laughs> Next thing I know, someone from Universal calls me and asks, are you writing a weed movie with Dave Chappelle? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and they go, when can you pitch it to us? And I was like, in 30 days' time. <laughs> so we had a month to figure the pitch out, and finally on day 29, I called Dave, and I'm like, dude, we gotta work this weed movie out. <laughs> and he goes, what weed movie? Anyhow, the day before the pitch, we outlined Half-Baked. It took the full day, about 16 hours, and that attention to detail really showed up on screen. I don't know about y'all, but I can't even move. Real B, right? It's like I feel stuck here, yo. Like I'm glued to the floor. I like smoking weed so much that I thought I should make a movie about this. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, we had this story, this weird story about <laughs> killing a police horse and needing to raise money. And it was really weird. My 24th birthday was coming on August the 24th, and I said, this is going to be a big one. And the morning that I turned 24, phone rang, and my sister was like, Dad had a stroke. For the next year, I watched my father teeter on life and death. And it was just all this stuff, man. Like I was, a dad was dying. The, Half baked, didn't come out the way I wanted it to come out. I was real upset about that. Because it was a real cool script. And then I saw it, I was like, hey man, you made a weed movie for kids. <laughs> and it wasn't for kids a script, you know. It was all these things, so much pressure. Africa. Then I, um, <laughs> I was in Ohio. I get a call on my cell phone from Hollywood. I'm like, hello, Hollywood. They're like, hello, Dave. They're like, that pilot you did for Fox, the, it looks like they want to pick it up. We need you to come out because they want to meet with you. And I was like, well, listen, I can't really come out right now. I've got a real bad situation at home. Can we talk about this on the phone? No, no, they would rather meet with you in person. Huh. But you know, like the whore that they turned us into, I jumped on that plane and left my father's bedside, which I regret to this day. And I went out and I sat with these people in this room. 
if you can imagine, I was the only black person in the room, and they basically told me that the, we'll pick up the show, but we want more white characters on it. For no other reason than they thought that it would give the show a more universal appeal. And uh, so I quit. Did you accuse them of racism? Absolutely. It was, it was racist. Look, I don't think these people sit around their house and call, call black people niggas and all this kind of thing, but the idea that unless I have white people around me on my show that it's unwatchable or doesn't have a universal appeal is racist. You know, they don't, they don't make them put black people on Friends or they don't make them put uh, black people on Seinfeld. But all of a sudden I get in the room and it's like, well, where's all the white people? And then, a few months later, dad dies. And that's hard for a young dude in his life. That's a, that's a real tough loss. I was there when he died. And he went from being my father to what are we going to do with the body. Within moments, it was over. And I'm going through all this stuff, and this is the guy I would usually talk to, right? Dad. And I got to figure this out for myself. I don't want to figure this out for myself. Look, man, at, at that point in your life, it, it's something so real in contrast to what Hollywood is, a very powerful illusion. And when your dad dies, it kind of just broke the spell, like, oh, this is bullshit. Look, I've been spending so much time doing this. What about my family? What about my friends? Wait, whatever happened to my friends? Damn, I don't even have any friends. Ugh. So I bounced, man. And, uh, New Year's Eve, 1999, I, I moved into that farm, and that was it. As far as I was concerned, I was done with show business. In 2000, you taped a concert for HBO. Yes. You called Killing Them Softly. Killing Them Softly. I'm not saying I don't like police. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm just scared of them. Nothing wrong with that. Sometimes we want to call them, too. Somebody broke into my house once. It's a good time to call him, but I don't know. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> the house is too nice. It ain't a real nice house, but they never believe I lived it. He's oh, still here. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Open and shut case, Johnson. I saw this once before when I was a rookie. Apparently, this nigger broke in and hung up pictures of his family everywhere. Dave and I were on the phone again, which was a thing people used to do. <laughs> and he says to me, hey, man, we should do a TV show like Playboy After Dark. Now, if you remember what Playboy After Dark was, get your affairs in order because you're on death's door. <laughs> If you don't remember Playboy After Dark, it was a super laid-back TV show in the 1970s hosted by Hugh Hefner, who was a magazine publisher and mild sex trafficker. <laughs> Imagine Jeffrey Epstein with a grotto. Anyway, Dave and I figured out a rough format for what would come to be Chappelle Show. Went around pitching to a few networks. HBO didn't go great. The woman actually said to Dave, and I quote, why do we need you when we have Chris Rock? <laughs> See, back then, there could only be one popular black comedian at a time. <laughs> Unlike today, when there can be three. So then a few minutes later, we pitched the Comedy Central, and they bought it. We made the pilot for Chappelle's show, we got picked up the series, and the show went really well. And it sets all these incredible records. Turns out the Half back Half a million end, in one day. Right. 1.2 million in a week. The largest selling television DVD of all time. Perhaps the greatest television show of all time. I think it's the greatest sketch comedy show of all time. Yeah, I'm but saying something bigger. He's got some sketches that were just groundbreaking, like the black white supremacist yeah. who was yeah. blind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Open up your heart and let that hate out. Yeah. 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 your face. We want to see your face. Yeah. Who said that? You want to see my face? Clayton, go on, brother. Do you want to see my face? Don't wait, I'm crying!
There is cookie and punch for us to enjoy, and we can make talk about white brotherhood. Thank you all for coming. White power! Mr. Bigsby was not harmed that night, but irreparable damage has been done to his reputation, and in many ways, the white power movement. We're told that in the last few weeks, he has accepted the fact that he is a black man. And three days ago, he filed for divorce from his wife. When we asked why, after 19 years of marriage, he responded, because she's a nigger lover. <laughs> I'm Kent Wallace. Good night. The thing that I love about Chappelle's show is that it allowed Dave to be his entire self, to express his intellect, his anger, his morality, his silliness, his hypocrisies, his sadness, his blazing talent. Chappelle was a rare thing. It was a fully faceted document of a human being living in the United States of America while having the surreal experience of being born with black skin. He was the hottest comedian in the country. Then he mysteriously disappeared. Why Dave Chappelle walked away from $50 million. Everybody wants to know, why'd you walk away? from $50 million? Well, I wasn't walking away from the money. Yeah. I was walking away from the circumstances uh -huh. that, that were coming with the newfound plateau. Yeah. I felt like in a, in a lot of instances, I was deliberately being put through stress. And they put in the paper that I had uh, pneumonia, God knows what. Mm -hmm. It was walking pneumonia, because I was walking all over the place. <laughs> uh, I was relaxing. Uh, and then, uh, after that, I, I was coming back to the show, and uh, then they were like, well, Dave, you know, you should just back up the pneumonia story. And I was like, I'm, you know, that was your thing. I'm not, I'm not backing up a pneumonia story. And then the, the next day, it was in the paper that I had writer's block. Then I knew something was getting ready to get stressful because I hadn't even started writing. <clears throat> it wasn't, I was on the schedule to write, so I was like, what's, you know, what's going on? Are they going to... So these are your people trying to feed... Manipulate me. Sounds like somebody's trying to put young Dave in a compromising position. <laughs> uh -uh, uh -uh, Oprah. Uh -uh, uh -uh. <laughs> but, you know, okay, so then I got worried. So when I said I'm not going to do it, then all of a sudden it was like, well, now he has walking pneumonia. And then I knew long before I walked, I had considered walking. You had considered I it? I had considered walking because I went back to work and the vitamin love was gone because it was a real ugly negotiation. It's a situation where now everybody's taking credit for this and that and the other. It's all, it's just, it was getting ridiculous. And I knew I was going to leave. So I got ahead of schedule and I bounced. And I didn't tell anybody where I was going. The whole time, they're trying to convince me I'm insane. They were trying to get me to take psychotic medication. Yeah. Like I'm sitting around, you know, I was stressed out. But the people that were telling me I was insane, I believe that they knew what was going on. So uh, this was troublesome. Yeah. I said, I'm not taking this medicine, man, because I know these people be trying to control you. Or, or maybe discredit you. I was afraid, like, you but know. But you were stressed out. That's why. There's no question. question. But. It's very stressful for someone to constantly walk behind you and say, you're insane. Oh, hey, how about this? I showed up to work the first week, and they, where my office used to be, they built a wall there. Why? I didn't know why. But it came out later that they were like, well, they said you wanted it. I don't want to be walled up at the office. <laughs> I like hanging out and talking. OK, so. You got up and you walked out and nobody knew where you were going. Did your family know? Nah, well, no, nah, I called my brother. Yeah. Me and my brother, real cool, I called him up and was like, uh, I'm going to Africa. So did you go to a psychiatric hospital? In South Africa? Yeah. Who? <laughs> Who? Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I was so 
I'm only asking because no, I need I'm to just, ask. No, I okay. got to get people thinking, all right, who goes from America to Africa <laughs> for medical attention? It's so much bigger than money, though, Dave. It's so much bigger than money. Oh, no, it was bigger than money. But you know what? It, I, I watched one of these nature shows one time, and they were talking about how a bushman finds water when it's scarce. Uh -huh. And they do what's called a salt trap. I, I, I didn't know this. Apparently, baboons love salt. OK. So they put a lump of salt in a hole, and they wait for the baboon. The baboon comes, sticks his hand in the hole, grabs the salt. Salt makes his hand bigger, and he's trapped. He can't get his hand out. Now, if he's smart, all he does is let go of the salt. The baboon doesn't want to let go of the salt. Then the bushman just comes, takes the baboon, throws him in the cage, and gives him all the salt he wants. And then the baboon gets thirsty. The bushman lets him out of the cage. The first place the baboon runs to is water. The bushman follows him, and they both drink to their fill. And in that analogy, I felt like the baboon. But I was smart enough to let go of the salt. Dave is a smart guy, man. He figured it out. He figured out where it was slipping away when they were fucking with him when he was doing the Chappelle show. And he was like, you know what? Let me just sit back for a bit. Dip down. Just sit back for a bit. If you were a superhero, Dave, what, what would be your superpower? Disappearing for long periods of time. <laughs> uh, and what would be your one weakness, Dave? The need for money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And then, I'm not even making a shit up. This motherfucker grabbed the pot and he goes, you don't know how scary the things I read in my briefings are. And I was like, holy shit, man. You ain't supposed to tell us that, bro. <laughs> That's bad leadership. <laughs> Even as a parent, you think I'm gonna sit my kids down? Hey, little man, come here real quick. I was gonna holler at you for a second. Yo, uh. I'm three months behind on the rent, nigga, and I am worried. Very worried. Go and go to school and have a productive day, nigga. I was just thinking out loud, getting some shit off my chest. I was like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? This is bad, man. That's some of our favorite stories, though, or someone who comes back. Like, Dave Chappelle's a perfect example of that. The, back, the way he did it, the way he walked away for 10 years and then came back and immediately went right to the top. Because I didn't come up with this idea on my own. This idea that a person can be born in the wrong body. But they have to admit, that's a fucking hilarious predicament. <laughs> it's really fucking funny. And if it happened to me, you'd laugh, wouldn't you? <laughs> that wouldn't be funny if it happened to me? I think it would be. What if, what if it did? What if, what if, I, was, what if I was Chinese, but, but born in this nigga body? That's not funny. <laughs> And for the rest of my life, I had to go around making that face. Hey, everybody, I'm tiny! <laughs> and everyone get mad. Stop making that face. That's offensive. What? <laughs> this is how I feel inside. Dave Chappelle's recent Sticks and Stones Netflix documentary, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, Rotten Tomatoes thought it would be a good idea to only have it reviewed by five super progressive critics. Mm -hmm. Only critics. They yeah. closed it off to the public. Yeah. It got 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. They then opened it to the public, and it got 99%. Of course. Uh, uh, here's the lost. thing. They're talking about a special called Sticks and Stones. This right. is what's so funny. Right. It might as well just be called, screw you, if you write a negative review of this because you're offended, you're taking the bait. And they took the bait! I called Dave. I don't give a fuck about these numbers, anything I got. Dave, in my opinion, you're the GOAT. In my opinion... Your last special has allowed you to surpass the Richard Pryor, in my opinion. Dave Chappelle, I got to witness do groundbreaking, controversial, 
movement as a comedian in the times where comedy was being frowned upon. Comedians were being held accountable for doing what we thought we would never be ridiculed for. Right. The one person that stood on a pedestal that got the attention that no others can get outside of a myself, a rock, a Seinfeld. He said, in the time where the fucking fire is the hottest, I'm going to do what nobody else will. You got to fucking applaud that. He stood up for comedy. He stood up for comedy. I'm Rick James.